Hello everyone. Welcome back to History 3560, American Military History 1. In this video, we're going to be discussing the U.S. military's primary missions from 1865 with the end of the Civil War to about the year 1890. First, we'll discuss the role the U.S. military played in reconstruction of the South post-Civil War. Second, we'll talk about the U.S. military's role as an internal security force in the eastern United States, particularly its role in suppressing labor strikes and riots. And we'll discuss how these operations against labor movements will give rise to the modern U.S. National Guard that we know today. Then we'll discuss the U.S. military, especially the U.S. Army's mission on the Western frontier in its wars against Native Americans. And throughout these discussions of the U.S. military's mission, we'll talk about some changes to U.S. military, especially U.S. Army, technology, equipment, recruitment, and training. And the image on this slide is of U.S. Army officer George Armstrong Custer. Um, he served in the Indian Wars out west, and this image is from about the end of the Civil War. And of course, we know that George Armstrong Custer will be killed uh, at the disastrous Battle of Little Bighorn. Well, disastrous for the U.S. Army. It's a major victory for uh, the Sioux. First, we'll discuss some background on Reconstruction. For context, less than 25% of Southern territory had been occupied by the Union during the Civil War. However, the South's most agriculturally and industrially productive regions and its most populous areas were the areas that were occupied by the Union, and these were the areas that saw the most uh, damage and destruction. Uh, the images on this on this slide show uh, destruction of Richmond, Virginia, the Confederate capital and an important industrial center. And also um, we can see the destruction of the rail lines at Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta was an important um, transportation, especially railroad hub in the Deep South. Because of this destruction, the South's economy and infrastructure would have to be rebuilt. Um, but its socio-political systems, which were based on slavery and white supremacy, would have to be redefined as well after the Civil War. And the U.S. Army would play an important role in Reconstruction. It would protect the rights of African Americans and of white Republicans. And it would uh, combat Southern uh, white supremacist gangs and paramilitaries many of which were actually made up of former Confederate States uh, Army veterans. This is an extremely difficult mission. Uh, the South is a large region of about 750,000 square miles. It has a population uh, at this point of about 5.5 million uh, white people, most of whom are going to be very hostile to the United States. And it has a population of about 3.5 million black people who are going to be sympathetic to uh, the U.S. Army. And of course, troop numbers uh, following the end of the Civil War are going to decrease significantly as the United States tries to demobilize after the Civil War. Uh, in 1865, there were about a million troops in the U.S. Army, most of whom were volunteers who had uh, signed up for service during the war. Uh, by 1866, there were only about 57,000 soldiers in the U.S. Army. By 1868, there were only about 17,000. And then by 1873, there were only about 8,000 troops. Um, this is because of post-war demobilization and Democratic Party opposition to Reconstruction. You remember from your American history courses that it was the Republican Party that was interested in reconstructing the South, um, redefining its social systems, while the Democratic Party um, generally wanted things to stay as much as possible like they were before the Civil War. If slavery had to be abolished, then at least keep the white supremacist social systems of slavery. That was what the Democratic Party and what most white Southerners wanted. 
And of course, the Democratic Party in the South had many allies in the North. And maintaining these armies, even very small ones, is very expensive. Uh, the northern public, northern civilians are war weary. They're ready to move on from the Civil War. Also, uh, there is a need to transfer troops to other parts of the country, particularly the West. So all of these reasons are going to really put a lot of stress on the U.S. military and its role uh, in occupying the South. Um, because Reconstruction is not just a change in social policies and rebuilding infrastructure. It is a military occupation of hostile territory. Uh, to be successful, military historians and military officers and strategists estimate that the United States would have had to maintain a much larger occupation force in the South. I would estimate that they would have needed at least 300,000 troops um, spread across the region, possibly more. You know, scholars are going to debate the numbers that would have been necessary. Uh, but remember, in military history, rational military considerations do not always impact and create military policy. Oftentimes, there are um, domestic considerations by the civilian populace, war weariness, concern about the high cost. In the case of uh, Democrats, for example, there was an opposition to the mission of the U.S. military, an opposition to Reconstruction. All of these things kept the United States from having the kind of troops needed to occupy the South and I would argue successfully complete reconstruction. And I come up with this number of about 300,000 troops based on studying the U.S. occupation of territory in post-World War II Germany and Japan. Um, these occupations, of course, were successful. The United States, um, its occupation zone in West Germany had about 17 million people. In the beginning, the U.S. Army had about 1.3 million troops. Those numbers will decrease with time, but there were a larger number of, of, of troops um, that were kept in the territory. On the other hand, though, I should note that um, the Japanese population was much higher, about 71 million, and the U.S. occupation force combined with um, troops from allies of the U.S. like Britain and the, its commonwealths. Uh, it was about 1.8 million uh, occupying troops to about 71 million Japanese people. So far, far lower numbers of troops for a much larger uh, population. So scholars, uh, military officers are going to debate uh, how many troops would have been needed to successfully occupy the South. But there's general agreement that more troops would have been needed and that the, the, the drawdown of U.S. Army soldiers, their uh, withdrawal from the South, um, played a major uh, role in Reconstruction's ultimate failure in the 19th century. This is a map of the South at the end of the Civil War. The light blue are areas uh, where there was significant um, military action, battles, and then occupation during the war. After the war ends, um, the remaining U.S. troops, even as their numbers are being drawn down, they're going to be spread um, out across the South as a whole. Remember that even though only about 25% uh, of the territory of the South was occupied by Union troops, the areas the Union did occupy were the most agriculturally, industrially, and um, in terms of population, the most productive regions of, of the South. You have places like Richmond, Virginia, Confederate capital and industrial center, Atlanta, Georgia, large city and uh, railroad hub, New Orleans, Louisiana, which was um, at the time the largest of all southern cities and a major port city. And of course, there's agriculture along the Mississippi River Valley. The Shenandoah Valley region of Virginia is very agriculturally productive as well. These are the areas that were targeted by Union military strategists during the Civil War. And this is where the most destruction uh, occurred during the Civil War. You can see uh, Sherman's March to the Sea here. You can see um, Union occupation of Northern and Central Virginia. These are the areas that are going to be the most devastated by the Civil War. But now the U.S. Army, a much smaller force, is going to be spread over a much larger region. So as I argued on the previous slide, it's not enough troops for the size of the Southern population. And it's certainly not enough troops 
for the size of the South in terms of uh, land and territory. And the U.S. Army plays an important role in Reconstruction, not only after the war um, ends, but during the Civil War as well. Uh, many military historians argue that Reconstruction began during the Civil War. Uh, a good example of a act of military reconstruction was Special Field Order Number 15, which was called for by Union General William Tecumseh Sherman. Sherman is known for the March to the Sea, which I discussed in a previous video. And Special Field Order Number 15 basically divided up land on the Low Country coast from South Carolina through Georgia down to Northern Florida. And it stated that this land should be given to freedmen, former slaves, in 48-acre plots, and that freedmen should receive a U.S. Army mule. These mules, uh, they pulled artillery caissons and they pulled wagons. But as the war was coming to an end, these mules were no longer necessary and they could be given to the freedmen who could use them to pull plows. And the idea was this land redistribution would give uh, the freedmen economic independence by allowing them to farm for themselves. Uh, special Field Order 15, though, it does not, um, it's not enacted, it's not put into place. U.S. President Andrew Johnson, who succeeded Abraham Lincoln as president, opposed it. So Special Field Order 15, while a part of wartime reconstruction, is not continued in the post-war reconstruction period. So now we'll discuss some of the uh, political acts of Reconstruction and the U.S. military and U.S. Army's role in enforcing them. After the U.S. Civil War, former Confederate states had to amend their constitutions to ban slavery. Remember, the, the 13th Amendment is passed during the Civil War. The 13th Amendment ends slavery. And this was a condition of being readmitted to the Union and having the rights of a U.S. state was banning slavery. And the states responded by banning slavery, but they also enacted what were called black codes. Um, these were laws that restricted um, the movement of uh, black people, that denied them the rights, many of the rights of free people. Of course, um, white Southerners also re-elected uh, former Confederate uh, politicians to Congress. And all of this was allowed by President Andrew Johnson, who was the successor of Abraham Lincoln. Initially, Johnson wanted to take a harder strategy against the South, but over time, he really began to give in to former Confederates and to Democrats. Johnson was actually from the state of Tennessee. And although he was a unionist, he did not want to see the South have new social systems that uh, dissolved white supremacy. Congress, however, was controlled by the Republican Party, particularly a group called the Radical Republicans. Um, you will have heard them in your American history classes in general discussions of Reconstruction. And the Radical Republicans, they wanted to reconstruct the South and um, eliminate the social systems um, that had grown up with slavery. So they passed the Reconstruction Acts of 1867, which divided the South into five military districts ruled over by uh, military governors. And the Radical Republicans, as part of this, also put the South under martial law, which allowed the um, U.S. Army to act with a lot more uh, flexibility in its operations. It didn't have to worry about um, U.S. civil law in the same way that it would if martial law had not been declared. This is the U.S. military's first long-term occupation uh, security force duty in hostile non-Native American territory. The U.S. Army had occupied territory in Mexico during the U.S.-Mexican War, but for much briefer periods of time, not for over, over a decade, as was the case with Reconstruction. This was for the U.S.-Mexican War was less than two years long, so a much shorter occupation. Also, Patriot militias had acted as internal security forces during the American Revolutionary War, and they had suppressed loyalist dissent. But the U.S. military had never done this kind of occupation and security force duty on this level and for this long of a period of time. 
The military governors would use the army and state militias to enforce congressional legislation, things like the Freedmen's Bureau Bill of 1865, uh, the Civil Rights Acts of 1866, and then the 14th Amendment uh, in 1868, and the 15th Amendment in 1870. These acts were designed to give not only freedom to African Americans, but give them uh, political equality with white people. Uh, and the southern states found ways to get around uh, these laws as much as possible. The U.S. military also saw action against white supremacist gangs, uh, groups like the KKK, uh, the Red Shirts, and the White League, uh, among others. Basically, there was low-level guerrilla warfare in the South um, from the end of the Civil War, really, until 1877. On the political side, uh, the Democratic Party in both the North and the South opposed both Reconstruction and the U.S. military. It advocated for drawdowns of troops. It was hesitant to vote in uh, funding for the U.S. military, uh, cut funding and things like that. Um, this was something that the older Democratic Republican and then old Jacksonian Democratic Party called for. Um, there was a uh, mistrust of standing armies in these old political parties. But the Democratic Party of the 1860s and 1870s was much more concerned with uh, the dissolution of white supremacist systems in the uh, post-Civil War South. And that's why they so vehemently opposed the U.S. military. Here are five of some of the most famous uh, U.S. Army District Generals. Um, left to right is um, General John Schofield, um, who was in charge of Virginia. Um, number two uh, is Dan Sickles, uh, who controlled North Carolina and South Carolina. Uh, number three is John Pope, uh, who controlled Alabama, Florida, and Georgia. You'll remember our discussion of John Pope uh, from our Civil War videos how he was defeated at uh, the Battle of Second Bull Run, but then he brutally suppressed the uh, Dakota uprising of Native Americans that took place in uh, the summer of 1862. Number four is uh, Edward Ord, who oversaw Arkansas and Mississippi. And number five is Philip Sheridan, who oversaw Louisiana and Texas. And Philip Sheridan earned uh, fame and arguably notoriety during the uh, American Civil War for his operations in the Shenandoah Valley, which were very similar to those of uh, William Tecumseh Sherman during the March to the Sea. So the U.S. Army um, played a major role in the Freedmen's Bureau, not only in its operations, but also in its um, security and protection. The Freedmen's Bureau was originally called the Bureau of Freedmen, Refugees, and Abandoned Lands. It was part of the War Department, but it was administered by both civilians and military personnel. Um, the Freedmen's Bureau provided educational, financial, and legal assistance to African Americans, but also uh, whites in the South who were loyal to the Union and supported the Republican Party's policies. Soldiers and Bureau agents, um, they tried to enforce federal law, but they were often brought up on charges of assault uh, in Southern courts. And this is what um, led to the um, placing the South under martial law, because these courts uh, were filled with white Southern juries, the vast majority of whom opposed Reconstruction. So Freedmen's Bureau agents and U.S. military personnel were um, basically convicted in Southern courts of things like assault for trying to complete their mission of enforcing the law, federal law. And this is one of the, this is why the South was put under martial law, so that U.S. soldiers could enforce federal law without having to face Southern courts. Arguably, uh, putting the South United States territory under martial law was a violation of the U.S. Constitution, but it was a necessary provision in order to uh, enforce Reconstruction Acts and protect uh, organizations like the Freedmen's Bureau, and of course to protect uh, the freedmen from angry white Southerners. This is just a scene of a white Southern mob destroying a African-American schoolhouse. 
The Freedmen's Bureau helped to build schools to educate African-American um, former slave children. That way they could have better jobs. And this was something that a lot of white Southerners opposed because uh, during slavery, um, black people were not permitted to read in the South. There were many opponents to Reconstruction. Um, the average white Southerner would have opposed Reconstruction. But there were also uh, militant organizations, um, gangs, some might call them terrorist groups. Um, this is probably not the most accurate term because terrorist organizations, they do not act on the part of a state or government. Um, but these, these white supremacist gangs did act on the part of governments. They acted on the part of the Democratic Party. And one of the most famous, of course, is the KKK or the Ku Klux Klan. Um, here are some images of what um, KKK members looked like in the Reconstruction era. You can see their garb is different than um, Klansmen in the 20th century. The KKK was founded by Nathan Bedford Forrest, a former Confederate general, also a former slave trader. And Forrest was a very controversial figure in the Civil War. Uh, we talked about Nathan Bedford Forrest and some of his actions uh, during the Civil War in a previous video. Um, basically, the KKK was a white supremacist fraternal organization and secret society. It was founded in late 1865 in Tennessee, and it opposed Reconstruction violently. It attacked African Americans and whites who supported Reconstruction and the Republican Party. For example, it attacked um, what they called carpetbaggers. That's a uh, derogatory term for Northerners who migrated to the South uh, after the Civil War, either to um, buy land that uh, was on sale after the war or to directly aid in the Reconstruction process. Uh, this cartoon here shows uh, the KKK with the symbol of the donkey for the Democratic Party having um, lynched or hanged um, carpetbaggers specifically one from Ohio. You can see his, his bag here. Also, the KKK uh, would have attacked and suppressed uh, white Southerners who supported Reconstruction. Uh, white Southerners who supported Reconstruction were called scalawags, which is a term for a, um, an old, worn-out horse. The KKK, however, was actually largely defeated in the early 1870s um, by the U.S. Army and by the state militias, thanks to what were called the Enforcement Acts of 1870 and 1871. And these, these acts were passed um, into law by President Ulysses S. Grant during his first term. Ulysses S. Grant, of course, was a former Union general. He was now President of the United States. And the Enforcement Acts, they allowed for the deployment of state militias and U.S. troops to suppress KKK activity. And it's worth noting that a large portion of the state militiamen during this period were black, and many of them had fought uh, in the Union Army during the Civil War, so they had combat experience. Grant also um, reinforced um, federal troops in districts where the KKK was the strongest, like in South Carolina in District 2. And the Enforcement Acts were initially successful. They led to what was basically the near destruction of the KKK in the early 1870s. But other paramilitary groups um, would become uh, more powerful after the KKK um, basically dissolved. Uh, groups like the Red Shirts in South Carolina and the White League in Louisiana would begin to replace the KKK uh, in the mid-1870s. So the victories that the U.S. military and the state uh, militias uh, saw as a result of the Enforcement Acts, uh, they were very temporary. The Enforcement Acts uh, fade, and a good example is the Colfax Massacre of 1873. On April 13, 1873, a group of white supremacist paramilitaries uh, slash gang members attacked a black militia at Colfax Parish Courthouse in Louisiana. Um, the black militia were guarding uh, Republican officials uh, trapped in the courthouse, and they were basically surrounded by these paramilitary gangs. Not the KKK, but groups like the White League, for example. 
Uh, the militia surrendered, but then they were massacred by the gangs. Uh, up to 153 uh, of the militia and their supporters were killed. You can see an image in the center of, of their bodies being uh, buried after the massacre. Uh, reinforcements were sent by former, believe it or not, Confederate General James Longstreet here on the left. Um, but they arrived the next day too late to stop the massacre. James Longstreet, although he was a Confederate general, he supported the Republican Party and Reconstruction. Um, this earned him the uh, epithet of scalawag for a southern person that supported Reconstruction. And of course, he was attacked by supporters of the Lost Cause as well. The Lost Cause were people that um, tried to explain why the South lost the Civil War, and they used a lot of um, white supremacist reasoning to discuss why the Civil War occurred. And naturally, they attacked uh, James Longstreet for his support of Reconstruction, and they even suggested that Longstreet was responsible for the Confederate defeat at Gettysburg. At the same time, the U.S. Army is, is being um, drawn down. It had a million troops in 1865. Uh, by 1866, it had 57,000 troops. By 1868, it had 17,000 troops. And by 1873, there's only 8,000 troops uh, remaining in the South. And there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, the Confederate states are um, politically, on paper, coming back into the Union and troops are being removed from states that are back in the Union. At the same time, uh, Dems in the U.S. government opposed funding for the U.S. Army uh, because they did not like the U.S. Army's mission of Reconstruction. And there are economic considerations at play here. The Panic of 1873 um, put the country into a very severe recession, and so there's less of a desire to spend on the U.S. Uh, Army and to spend on Reconstruction when Americans across the country are suffering financially as a result of the 1873 recession. Here's some of the other opponents to Reconstruction. Um, the red shirts, this is one of their um, uh, uniform shirts. Here is an image of red shirts actually from much later, from the 1890s. Um, and groups like the red shirts, like the KKK before them, they became the paramilitary wing of the Democratic Party in the South, um, both during and after Reconstruction. And I said that these groups were paramilitary gangs. I didn't say that they were terrorist organizations because they're acting on the behalf of a government. That doesn't mean that what they did were, was good. Um, the acts they committed were, were terrible. Um, violence, um, lynchings, uh, voter intimidation, um, but I'm using the technical term of, of paramilitary gangs to describe um, groups like the Red Shirts because they were acting on the behalf of a government and political organization. Remember, terrorists, they don't act on the part of a government or political organization, at least not officially. So now we'll discuss the end of the 19th century Reconstruction in 1877. Um, it's been said that uh, the United States or the Union, it wins the Civil War, 1861 to 1865, but it loses the peace of Reconstruction, 1865 to 1877. As military historians, however, we would say the Union Army wins the peace of the Civil War, 1861 to 1865, but it loses the War of Reconstruction as well, 1865 to 1877. This was low-intensity guerrilla warfare across the South and a military occupation. So it would be wrong to say that the Reconstruction period was a time of peace. Anyway, uh, I'll mention some of the political events that led to the official end of Reconstruction in the 19th century. Reconstruction came to an end officially in the 19th century, 1877, with what was called the Tilden Com Compromise. And you probably heard of the Tilden Compromise um, during U.S. history survey, so I won't go into too much detail about what it was here. But basically, um, Republican President Rutherford B. Hayes ran alongside or against uh, Democratic um, presidential candidate Samuel Tilden. Tilden won the popular vote by a large margin, but there were widespread reports of voter fraud and voter intimidation in the South. 
And Hayes went on to win the Electoral College by one point of 185 to 184. White Southerners and Democrats threatened civil war if Hayes was inaugurated president. Um, in order to prevent the war, Republicans made what was called the Tilden Compromise, which ended Reconstruction. It allowed white Democrats to retake control of Southern governments, and it withdrew the last remaining federal troops who were enforcing the Reconstruction Acts. Uh, basically, white Southern Democrat rule was returned to the South in exchange for Republican Rutherford B. Hayes being allowed to become president. And this was done not only to prevent a possible civil war, but because white Americans in the North, they were becoming tired of paying for the deployment of troops in the South. They preferred to have US troops be deployed out in the Western frontier to fight Native Americans. And they also preferred that the US military be used actually in the North to break up uh, strikes and riots. There were a lot of labor strikes and labor riots in uh, 1877 and even afterwards. And as I mentioned before, the US Army had won the conventional war, the Civil War against the CS Army, but it lost the unconventional guerrilla war against white Southern guerrillas and paramilitaries, you know, groups like the Red Shirts that I mentioned before. And there's the question, could the US Army have defeated the guerrillas and could they have made Reconstruction a success? Military historians and strategists debate this point. They tend to agree that um, the US would have needed a lot more financial support and it would have needed a lot more personnel reinforcements. It also would have needed a lot more um, support from the US government, things that it just didn't have as the war-weary Northern population preferred to use the US military to uh, defeat Native Americans in the West rather than um, enact Reconstruction in the South. And of course, um, one political party was very hostile to Reconstruction as well. So because of these divisions, um, rational military considerations, um, adding more troops to the South, reinforcing um, US troops that are already there, they don't happen. And as a result, um, Reconstruction is, is a failure. It's not only a political failure, but it's a military failure as well for the United States. And to go along with this, um, keep in mind that Americans, uh, even Northern Americans, they still had a lot of mistrust for standing armies, uh, especially when they were deployed as uh, a security force rather than as um, a military force um, fighting, you know, external enemies like Native Americans. They were very were nervous about the idea of um, the US Army being used against US citizens, uh, even former Confederates. And they also, um, Democrats in the South and Democrats in the North opposed the US military and opposed Reconstruction because they disagreed with the goals of Reconstruction. Here is a, um, political cartoon from Puck Magazine. Puck Magazine was a um, satirical magazine uh, published in the 1870s. Actually, it was published in St. Louis, which St. Louis was a, a northern state, but it was a former slave state. There would have been a lot of anti-Reconstruction um, people in, in, in Missouri, St. Louis, Missouri. The left panel shows President Ulysses S. Grant uh, dressed in a military uniform, sort of a Napoleonic style military uniform, sort of mocking him as sort of a Napoleon-esque dictator. Um, he's riding on a carpet bag that's full of weapons that's uh, suppressing the solid South. The solid South is a term used for um, anti-Reconstruction, um, pro-white supremacy uh, Southerners and what they hope to do with the South after the Civil War. And of course, um, you see that Grant and the carpet bag is being guarded by uh, US soldiers. There's tents, there's um, sunken ships and ironclads in the rear. And basically Puck Magazine is saying that Grant's militaristic reconstruction plan is a bad thing and it's not leading to prosperity in the South. This of course, this cartoon is not very fair to Ulysses S. Grant. He did support reconstruction, but he was not a radical Republican. Uh, he was just trying to bring peace to the region. His campaign slogan when he ran for president for his second term actually was, let us have peace, uh, when he ran for president in 1872. 
so it's not really a fair political cartoon to grant. But when are political cartoons ever, ever fair? The other panel shows uh, Rutherford B. Hayes, the next Republican president who took what the uh, magazine calls the let him alone policy, withdrawing troops from the South, um, turning swords into plowshares, which is a biblical reference, uh, burying guns, burying reconstruction, and returning the South basically to um, white Southern Democrat, white supremacist rule, which Punk Magazine says will lead to prosperity, will lead to cotton being made, cornfields being raised, uh, peaceful relations between white people and black people. Obviously, it's a very uh, politically slanted cartoon, very slanted in favor of um, the white supremacist Democrats. By the way, the white supremacist Democrats um, who wanted to create the solid South, they called themselves the Redeemers because they believed that they were redeeming the South, uh, making it better, returning it to its pre-Civil War social systems just without official slavery. In spite of uh, the end of Reconstruction and the return of white supremacy, the suppression of African-American uh, voting rights, uh, the Jim Crow laws and things like that, uh, African-Americans actually still served in militia units uh, in the South, which is very interesting and surprising to see. This is an image of the Capitol City Guards from Montgomery, Alabama in 1885. These militias uh, faced a lot of discrimination and marginalization from the state governments but they still manage to um, uh, exist and stay together, even in the post-Reconstruction uh, Jim Crow era South. This is the 6th Virginia Volunteers uh, from about 1892 is when this photograph was taken. Uh, they actually were used to suppress a longshoreman's strike in 1887. Um, that strike um, was, was led by longshoremen in Eastern Virginia and the governor of Virginia, whose name was Fitzhugh Lee, he was related to Confederate General Robert E. Lee, actually sent this black militia to um, break up that longshoreman strike. That was a very controversial decision that uh, Governor Lee actually got in trouble for. And I'm not saying that uh, Lee was a um, was pro-African-American. He was actually very much on the uh, anti-Reconstruction, uh, white supremacist side of things politically. It's just interesting to see these um, African-American militia organizations uh, flourishing even in a part of the country that was um, highly opposed to uh, African-American rights and uh, the freedom of, of black people. So now we'll discuss um, the U.S. military's role in breaking up strikes and breaking up uh, labor riots in the post-Reconstruction era and how these operations lead to the creation of the U.S. National Guard that we know today. So in 1877, the Gilded Age industrialization was in full swing. Um, if you want to know more about the uh, Gilded Age, uh, there will be some supplemental videos um, linked to this one. Working class people across the country were striking for better wages and working conditions, and sometimes they went on strike and they had peaceful protests. Other times these protests would escalate to violence, to riots, to destruction of property. And the U.S. military, especially militias, would be used to suppress these labor strikes. The U.S. military had briefly been used to suppress uh, labor strikes in the 1830s, but that was a very limited, um, limited operation. It's going to become much more common in the late 1870s and through into the, into the 20th century. Initially, the regular army was used to break up strikes and riots, but the Posse Comitatus Act of 1878, which was actually a, um, an act that was part of uh, the post-Reconstruction South, um, it was designed to limit the operations of the U.S. Army and law enforcement. This was a reaction to how the U.S. Army had been used to enforce the Reconstruction Acts. But the Posse Comitatus Act also limited um, the U.S. Army's uh, operations to break up strikes as well. Um, this would mean that it would instead have to be handled by militias, uh, state militias. In addition, it was very impractical for 
um, regular army, professional army soldiers to be withdrawn from the West. Most of the US Army regulars were fighting in the West at this point, bringing them back from the West to the East to suppress labor strikes. It did happen, but it was uh, very impractical, um, withdrawing troops from one region of the country and deploying them in another. Uh, consequently, these strike-breaking uh, missions were handled by the US militia. And because of this, the National Guard Association is created in 1879. Uh, the National Guard Association, its goal is to modernize and standardize the militias, increase their training, uh, provide them with better uniforms and better arms and equipment, and basically make them uniform and standard across the country, even as they are administered by different states. Before this, militias, their uniforms, their equipment, their training varied significantly depending on what state they were from. The National Guard Association wants to standardize things so that um, the National Guard can um, operate uh, more easily, especially in joint operations with other, other state militias. The demographics of these militias or the National Guard, um, as was the case with militia units earlier in American history, it's mostly middle class, native born uh, white men. Although there were some black men in militias, as, as we mentioned on a previous couple of slides. And these were men who had good jobs and good civilian careers. They wanted to serve in the US military, but they wanted to do so on a part-time basis. They did not want to give up their civilian careers for their military service. And in general, the um, middle-class guardsmen, they didn't really like to be deployed as security forces fighting against um, working-class people. Some did, but generally they would have preferred um, just to have remained as reservists to be used in uh, times of great difficulty if, if the United States was facing a possible external invasion. And at the same time, the full-time US regular army, which was fighting primarily in the West at this point, like um, the antebellum period and the early Republican period, um, you know, the early 1800s, um, the regular professional army is mostly made up of poorer men, a lot of working class men, a lot of immigrants uh, from northern, northern cities. The demographics of the professional army are going to change over time as well, but uh, in this period, in the late 1800s, the demographics of the regular army are very similar to the demographics uh, of the regular army in the early 1800s. And during this period, the US government's also increasing funding to the National Guard, to these militia units. They're becoming more standardized, more modernized, and more professionalized. And they eventually are going to evolve into a National Guard that would be recognizable to us today. And the, the National Guard is going to be deployed over 700 times between 1877 and the year 1903. And the image on this slide is of National Guardsmen from about the 1870s. You can see they're wearing uniforms very similar to those of Civil War soldiers. These are some scenes from the militia's deployments um, during the 1877 railroad strike. You can see uh, buildings are being burned um, and the US militias are engaging uh, labor rioters. And then afterwards, the uh, militias guarded uh, workers as they uh, rebuilt after the strikes and after the uh, riots. In this, in this image, they're um, pushing a lo railroad locomotive back onto the tracks. Now we'll talk about the U.S. Army in the West from 1865 to the 1890s. The U.S. Civil War had been fought primarily by volunteer soldiers and by conscripts uh, or draftees. It was not fought by um, professional soldiers who had made military service their long-term career. Um, there were regular army officers, career soldiers in, in command and leadership, but the enlisted ranks uh, were more likely to be made up of volunteers and conscripts than they were of uh, professional soldiers who had been in the army before the war. Um, a lot of these enlisted regulars, um, professional soldiers, they actually remained at posts on the Western frontier uh, and they were joined by some volunteers during the war, uh, along with frontier militias. In some cases, even a few um, Confederate prisoners of war were actually sent west uh, 
to fight with the U.S. Army against Native Americans. Um, and I say this because the Indian Wars that the United States had been fighting against Native Americans, they did not end during the Civil War. In fact, in some ways, the, uh, the Indian Wars intensified during the Civil War as Native American powers sought to take advantage of the war between the Confederacy and the Union. It's a very common trend in um, Native American history for Native American powers to uh, take advantage and try to play off various um, European or Euro-American um, countries that are fighting each other. In this case, the Confederacy and the Union are fighting each other, and Native Americans generally remain neutral, but some fought with the Confederacy and some fought with the Union and tried to use this conflict between white people as a way to benefit themselves, which is very understandable, and we've seen this throughout American history. But there, of course, were operations against uh, Native Americans by the U.S., by the Union, during the American Civil War. We discussed those in uh, previous lecture videos. After the Civil War, um, the regular army returned. A lot of the regular army returned to the West to fight Native Americans. Um, some of these wars had actually been going on before and during the Civil War. Other new wars happened after the Civil War. There's um, several famous Native American wars post-Civil War. Um, there's the Apache Wars, which begin in 1846, um, and they continue to 1886 uh, intermittently. There's the Comanche Wars of 1836 to 1877, which continue intermittently as well. And then there's the Sioux Wars uh, of 1854 to um, 1890 or 1891, uh, which continue off and on um, uh, during the post-Civil War period. And there's similar trends in the U.S. Army's operations against Native Americans in the post-Civil War West, um, particularly the use of irregular warfare and the use of irregular warfare being tied to uh, the success of the U.S. military. So to this end, the U.S. Army is victorious when it exploits its technological, industrial, and logistical capabilities, when it's able to field much larger armies and keep them in uh, supplies and materiel for longer than the Native Americans can, their own, their own um, military forces. The United States recruits uh, soldiers from its larger population, including immigrants um, who joined the regular army and African Americans who joined the regular army. And as I mentioned before, even a handful of uh, ex-Confederate prisoners. Um, these were called galvanized soldiers, and they were sent to fight uh, for the U.S. Army against Native Americans towards the end of the Civil War. And of course, there is some um, alliance with militias and civilians, as you can see uh, in this slide here from the Wagon Box fight in 1867. In addition, um, the United States does a lot better when it exploits existing uh, conflicts between Native American societies and making alliances with other Native American powers uh, and even recruiting Native Americans into the U.S. Uh, Army. And then um, to finish off uh, its keys to success, the U.S. military would target the logistics and supplies of its Native American enemies, including in some cases Native American non-combatants. And this is what we call irregular warfare. These were uh, trends you see throughout uh, American military history, and they're going to be key to the U.S. military success in the Indian Wars from 1865 to the 1890s. And this map here shows uh, major U.S. Army forts and installations in the West. You can see uh, forts here. And then uh, the cross swords or battles. These are very standard uh, military cartography symbols. And you can see where, where the battles are taking place. There's a lot of battles in the Great Plains and in the Southwest. In the, um, the Southwest, the U.S. Army and its allies are fighting the Apaches and the Comanches. And then in the Great Plains, they're fighting um, various uh, members of the Sioux tribe or the Sioux Confederation, along with groups like the Cheyenne and the Arapaho, who are going to be allies of the Sioux. And in this region, um, 
The United States will make alliances with the Crow people and the Pawnee people, among others. And at the same time, or in the years after, the United States will often go to war with its former allies, as was the case with the Crow War. Former allies of the United States become enemies. And there were also um, battles during the, um, or within the Intermountain West. Uh, not as many battles, but these, these um, conflicts should not be forgotten about either. They're also very significant. So now we'll discuss the causes of these Indian Wars and some of the same causes that provoked um, fighting between the U.S. and Native Americans are evident um, in, in these conflicts as well. The causes of individual conflicts could vary somewhat, but the general um, casus belli or cause of the war was increased white settlement on Native American lands in the Western U.S. Uh, and then, of course, the differences between how um, non-indigenous and indigenous Americans lived. Um, Non-indigenous settlement increases in the West, uh, both during and after the Civil War, as white Americans and um, European and some Asian immigrants in smaller numbers of African Americans um, take advantage of what is called the Homestead Acts of 1862. Um, the Homestead Acts basically divided up the West and would give um, prospective settlers 160 acres of free land in the West. A lot of Americans took advantage of the Homestead Acts to settle in the West and have land that was free, at least to them. Even non-citizens actually could take advantage of the Homestead Acts. Uh, the Act called for prospective citizens to receive land as well. Uh, the Homestead Acts in many ways were a very forward-thinking piece of legislation, a lot like the Northwest Ordinance, um, which was mentioned in a, in a different video. But of course, um, there's a lot of problems with this. There are people living on this land already. And if you'd like more information about uh, the provisions of the Homestead Act, uh, there will be uh, supplemental videos uh, included with this one. As I mentioned, differing life ways between Native Americans and non-Indigenous people, um, non-Indigenous Americans. Um, non-Indigenous Americans practiced agriculture in a way that the people of the Great Plains, for example, did not. Um, they engaged in mining, especially for gold and silver, and they engaged in other types of resource extraction like logging. And these uh, resource extraction, especially gold and silver mining uh, industries, will attract a lot of settlers. Um, transcontinental railroads, um, the first of which was completed in 1869, they will greatly lower the cost of westward migration and they will allow for increased uh, migration also from the west coast, from California, into the western interior. The U.S. Army's primary mission was to pacify the region and in some cases they were even tasked with removing uh, white settlers from indigenous reservation lands and trying to uphold previous treaties that the U.S. had made with Native Americans. But over time though, pressure from white settlers uh, would lead the U.S. government to task the U.S. Army with fighting against Native Americans, even if uh, white settlers had been the initial trespassers on reservation lands. But as I mentioned, the causes of each individual war could vary somewhat within these kind of larger overarching um, trends. In the images on this slide, a non-indigenous settlement in the West, um, the division of, of uh, land in the West and the increased settlement by non-indigenous people would have put pressure on the life ways of Native Americans, especially the Native Americans living on the Great Plains who were uh, semi-nomadic um, with um, a culture based around um, horseback riding and hunting of bison or buffalo. And then on the right is Geronimo, an Apache warrior whose war bands were defeated by the U.S. Army, as well as um, Mexican troops and even Apaches, um, Apaches fighting Apaches. Uh, and this is in 1886. Here are the transcontinental railroads that I referenced uh, in the previous slide. The first uh, transcontinental railroad, this one, was completed in 1869. Um, later railroads were added in the north and in the south. And these railroads can be used to transport settlers to the West, but also to transport soldiers and um, military supplies and material to the West. And this is uh, the celebration of the connecting of the first transcontinental railroad in 
uh, Promontory Point, Utah, which is right here. So here are some shots of uh, non-indigenous settlers in the West. We see farmers plowing uh, land, dividing up land for themselves. Uh, this leads to less uh, acreage for buffalo, uh, which are a primary food source for many Native American nations. Uh, mining uh, of gold and silver uh, also was very deleterious to the environment um, and also put uh, Native Americans and non-indigenous people at odds with each other. And other industries like logging also um, had a negative impact on uh, the environment and led to uh, disagreements between Native Americans and uh, Euro-Americans and other settlers. So now we'll talk about some of the uh, grand strategists of the U.S. Um, military's fight against Native Americans in the West. Um, Generals William Tecumseh Sherman and Philip Sheridan, uh, both of whom took part in um, the Civil War and in Reconstruction. They pioneered a hard war strategy during the Civil War. It's a term used by uh, American military historians for the type of war that um, Sherman and uh, Sheridan fought against um, the Confederacy in the, the later later days of the war. And this, this is a type of irregular warfare that targeted uh, Confederate civilians uh, as a way of ending Southern economic production and then ending Southern resistance to the Union. And they would call for similar, but arguably more aggressive, irregular hard war strategies against Native Americans. And actually some humanitarian minded Americans criticized um, um, Sherman and Sheridan strategies. When I, when I say humanitarian Americans, I should clarify white humanitarian Americans who opposed these strategies. They believed that Sherman and Sheridan were going too far in, in their irregular warfare strategy and they were causing Native American resistance. Sherman and Sheridan would have disagreed. They would have said they were just trying to win the wars uh, as quickly as possible. So now we'll discuss the Great Sioux War. We'll use that as a case study for how, how the wars in the American West went for the US military and, and how they went for Native Americans. There were of course many wars that were uh, taking place in this period and a lot of these wars were intermittent. They were off and on. But we'll talk about what is called the Great Sioux War, which is a part of the, US, um, the US's wars against the Sioux people. By 1872, white settlers had begun to illegally encroach on Sioux reservation lands, particularly in the, these western regions in the Black Hills. Um, the U.S. government had tried to stop white settlers from coming into Sioux territory, but in the 1870s there were just too many settlers, uh, especially gold prospectors who had um, heard about gold being discovered in the Black Hills and they wanted to strike it rich in, um, in Sioux territory. Also, there were trees that could be cut down for a logging industry as well. At the same time, um, Native Americans were fighting other Native Americans in this region. The Crow people to the north and the Shoshone people to the uh, west were fighting against um, various um, peoples within the Sioux tribe or Sioux nation, uh, particularly against the Lakota. They were fighting over land and resources. Uh, the Lakota were a very uh, militaristic and expansionist Native American people. Uh, remember, warfare was an important part of Native American life even before the arrival of uh, non-Indigenous and European people in the Americas. And this leads to the Crow and the Shoshone and some other uh, Native American powers actually um, fighting against the Lakota during the Great Sioux War. The Lakota will have their own allies. They'll have the Dakota Sioux, and then they'll have the Cheyenne and the Arapaho uh, as their allies. The U.S. will have the Crow, the Shoshone, the Pawnee, who are from much further to the east, and the Arikara as well. Um, these, will, uh, these, these Native American nations will side with the U.S. against the Lakota. And of course, this is a common trend in Native American history as, as the U.S. will try to exploit divisions between Native American peoples to its own advantages. So now we'll discuss the tactics and strategy used by the belligerents in the Great Sioux War. The U.S. and allies, they will leverage their logistical, industrial, and technological capabilities. 
mainly the U.S., but they will um, also reinforce their Native American allies. And then the U.S. and its allies will use irregular warfare. They'll fight in uh, late fall, winter, and early spring when there's um, less forage for the enemy's soldiers and um, mounts. During, during this time of the year, late fall, winter, early spring, there's a lot less grass to eat because it's covered in snow. Um, this means that horses are weaker and skinnier and they can't run as fast and they can't um, run for as long. And Native Americans whose warfare is based heavily on mounted uh, warriors, they're going to um, uh, not be able to fight as well during the colder months. And then the U.S. works best when it moves slowly with cavalry, infantry, and artillery. And the idea is to outlast its uh, Native American opposing forces. The Lakota and their allies, um, they need to play to their strengths. They need to use their superior knowledge of the ground and intel on where they're fighting. Um, that way they have sort of home field advantage, as we say. And of course, they need to use their highly mobile warriors on horseback to isolate smaller op four, in this case, US units. Um, these these uh, Native Americans were very skilled horseback riders. They trained um, constantly with their horses. They were trained to um, even pick up warriors who'd fallen off their horses. So they were very skilled at fighting on horseback. So they would want to fight at times of the year when they could best use their horses. Times of the year like the summer, the spring, when there's plenty of grass on the ground for horses to eat. Also, um, enemies of the, of the United States, they would purchase firearms from white traders who would Ill illegally sell Native Americans guns so they could make a, a, a tidy profit. Um, in particular, Native Americans bought um, repeating Henry rifles. Um, Native Americans used a variety of, of weapons, including bows and arrows, muzzle loaders, breech loaders, and repeating rifles like the Henry. And the images on this slide are of George um, Armstrong Custer and then uh, Lakota war chief Crazy Horse, an important leader of the uh, Lakota faction during the Great Sioux War. Here are some of the uh, battles fought during the, uh, the Sioux Wars, including the Great Sioux War. You'll notice um, these battles here from the Great Sioux War. Uh, number 14 is the Battle of Little Bighorn River, the most famous uh, of all of the Great Sioux War battles. Uh, we'll talk about that battle in a moment. This, of course, is to give you an idea of where, where the conflict is being fought. Uh, in this case, the Battle of Little Bighorn is actually happening more in Crow territory, which was basically north and west of uh, Lakota territory. The Battle of Little Bighorn was fought on uh, June 25th, 1876. It's being fought during the summer, a time when uh, the Lakota with their mounted warriors are going to have an advantage. Um, George Custer had about 700 cavalry troops from the 7th U.S. Cavalry. He also had uh, Crow scouts, and he made some important uh, tactical mistakes that really um, hampered the effectiveness of his, of his force at this battle. He divided his force into uh, three smaller detachments. Custer was overconfident and impatient. He wanted to end the war quickly. He wanted to capture uh, the Native Americans at uh, Little Bighorn River. And he wanted to uh, end the war and move beyond uh, the conflict. Uh, and because he was moving so quickly, he left behind his infantry and his artillery. Particularly, he left behind Gatling guns. Um, basically, the, uh, the world's first machine guns. And uh, he, he just decided that he wanted to just try to overwhelm the Lakota and their allies rather than um, playing to his strengths of uh, larger forces and um, um, larger weapons and artillery. Uh, what he found was that the Sioux had uh, up to 2,500 warriors along with a lot of civilian support in their village on the Little Bighorn River. Custer would deploy his detachment uh, on a small hill which gave him some defensive advantage, but not against a overwhelming uh, Sioux force. This is just a couple hundred U.S. cavalry and scouts against over 2,000 um, Native American uh, warriors. The Sioux, uh, they surround Custer's detachment outside their village. 
They killed they kill Custer and they defeat his detachment. Only a handful of American uh, soldiers survived. And there's even some debate as to whether those soldiers were actually part of Custer's last stand, as it came to be called. Um, Custer's other detachments, commanded by Marcus Reno and Frederick Benteen, they were attacked as well, and they were not able to relieve Custer's force. They're able to survive the battle, but Custer and his, his detachment are, are basically destroyed. And the Battle of Little Bighorn is one of the worst military defeats in U.S. history. By the way, as you'll see in this course, some of the worst military defeats the United States ever endured came actually from uh, Native Americans, which, of course, is a testament to their uh, military skill and uh, their resistance uh, to the United States' expansion. And this, this conflict is called the Battle of the Greasy Grass by uh, the Sioux victors. And here we see some images of, this is of General Custer and his Native American scouts uh, who provide him a lot of important intel during uh, his his time in the Great Sioux War. Um, he obviously did not listen to the intelligence that his, his scouts uh, imparted to him about the size of the, the Sioux force. And here is a uh, painting of, of uh, Sioux warriors in action. The Battle of Little Bighorn River, it takes place to the west of uh, the Great Sioux Reservation, actually in what is now Montana, the state of Montana. This is a battle map here of uh, the forces engaged. Remember, um, rectangles with slashes through them indicate cavalry. All of the U.S. forces at this battle are cavalry. They left behind their uh, infantry and artillery, which probably would have given them an edge in the battle. Um, Custer's forces are surrounded um, to the north of the uh, Native American lodges or village, and Reno and Benteen remain off to the east, unable to really help uh, Custer prevent his detachment from being destroyed. Here is a uh, depiction of Custer's last stand. As I mentioned on a previous slide, Custer's troops were um, on a small hill. Um, this is Custer in the center. He's actually wearing a uh, buckskin over his uh, military uniform. And this is the hill itself today. The um, defeated, the, the, the soldiers that were, U.S. soldiers that were killed, um, along with some of their Native American scouts um, of the Crow were killed as well. And their bodies were buried exactly where they were found. So you can have actually a really good um, idea of uh, the position of these, these, these troops when they, when they were, were killed and where they fought in this battle. We don't know exactly how, how the battle went. A lot of the reports that we have were um, from uh, US troops who witnessed the battle from very far away, or they were from US troops who uh, investigated the battlefield after, after Custer's defeat. Um, we think that Custer's troops tried to uh, attempt a breakout of uh, the Sioux around from the Sioux that were surrounding them on all sides, but the breakout failed and, and most of them were killed. There's reports that uh, Native American women were actually involved in the battle and that they um, finished off a lot of the uh, wounded American soldiers. Uh, but this, this report, um, we don't know for sure. It may have been created by U.S. soldiers who were attempting to uh, portray Native Americans uh, in a more negative light. So what we do know is that uh, Custer's force was completely defeated, except for perhaps a couple of survivors. Here are some additional depictions of Custer's last stand. This is a uh, Cheyenne uh, buffalo skin uh, showing uh, the U.S. soldiers being defeated by um, uh, the Cheyenne and the Lakota. This is a, um, a lithograph of, of Custer and his troops fighting um, the Lakota they're being surrounded, as you can see. The American soldiers used their dead horses as cover um, to uh, hide behind and shoot at the, uh, the uh, charging Lakota and Cheyenne. Now we'll discuss uh, the weapons used at the Battle of Little Bighorn, and they play a major role in the result of this battle, the uh, Lakota victory. The U.S. Cavalry primarily used single-shot Sharps breech loaders, uh, seen here, top left of this slide. The Sharps breech loader was a very good, a very solid, dependable weapon. It was used during the American Civil War. Uh, it had a long range. Uh, 
It's a breech loader, so it loads faster than a muzzle loader, but it only can hold one round at a time, meaning that the rate of fire of a soldier with a sharps is going to be a lot lower than a soldier armed with the multi-shot lever action Henry rifle. The Henry rifle uh, was used briefly in the Civil War as well. Um, it's loaded through a tube magazine that is inserted from the rear, and this, this weapon has a lot higher of a rate of fire. Um, Native Americans used a variety of, of firearms at this battle. They used bows and arrows, they used uh, breech loaders, they used muzzle loaders, but they also used the aforementioned Henry rifle because of its high rate of fire. They purchased Henry rifles from uh, white traders. Technically, white traders were not allowed to sell um, weapons like the Henry to Native Americans, but some sold weapons like the Henry to them anyway because <clears throat> it was a very profitable trade uh, selling these uh, weapons. Also, the United States was hesitant to adopt um, uh, weapons like the Henry rifle because of the high cost of, of re-equipping their troops, having to turn over um, or equip them with more ammunition because of the higher rate of fire of these weapons. In addition, the United States was copying uh, Prussian military tactics and strategy during this period. The Prussians had just defeated the French in the Franco-Prussian War using single-shot um, Druze rifles. And so they felt that if the Prussians could defeat the French with single-shot rifles, then the United States ought to be able to defeat Native Americans with single-shot rifles. Um, but obviously that was not the case the, uh, at the Battle of Little Bighorn, at least. The uh, Native Americans, including the Lakota, they made good use of the Henry rifles they had along with their other weapons to defeat the, uh, the U.S. Army. By the way, the U.S. Army is actually not going to adopt a multi-shot um, semi-automatic, um, or not semi-automatic, but bolt-action rifle until 1892, and that's the uh, Krag Jorgensen, which is actually a, a weapon from Norway. But that's not going to be until 1892, and you can see that, that rifle here. You'll also notice there's a trend here. Uh, Native Americans, well, they don't have the kind of um, logistical resources to uh, keep up with the U.S. technologically. They're very willing to adapt uh, and adopt um, the newest technology that's available to them. You remember in colonial times, Native Americans did not use the old style matchlock muskets. They preferred to use the flintlock muskets, which were uh, a newer and better weapon. And in some cases, they actually we're using flintlocks even when um, Euro-American colonists are using uh, um, older matchlocks. So it would be incorrect to say that Native Americans always had worse technology than um, um, the United States or uh, non-indigenous people in America. They often just didn't have the kind of access to the newest technology, but they used it whenever they could. Also contributing to Custer's defeat was his lack of artillery, which artillery would have negated um, the fact that he was significantly outnumbered, uh, particularly the Gatling gun. The Gatling gun was the first um, machine gun uh, developed. Um, it was operated with this crank and uh, rounds are shot through this magazine at the top. And the Gatling gun um, can fire at least 200 rounds per minute. Later versions could fire more like 350. So uh, a weapon like this, used properly by Custer, could have um, ensured his victory over a much larger Native American force. And of course, we know the disastrous, disastrous effects that machine guns could have on uh, cavalry. Um, we've seen that in the later conflicts, especially the First World War. So uh, Custer made a lot of mistakes in dividing his force and in not taking advantage of, of the logistical capabilities he had and not using things like artillery, which might have turned the tide of the battle in his favor. He just thought that the artillery would slow him down too much. Here are some modern warring actors uh, operating a Gatling gun. Uh, one is turning the crank, the other is uh, aiming the piece. And of course, it's um, being fired using these magazines at the top. Here are some uh, former Crow scouts. The Crow fought actually on uh, the U.S. side in the Great Sioux War. This is actually them visiting the uh, Little Bighorn battlefield. 
1907, about 30-ish years after uh, the Battle of Little Bighorn took place. So now we'll talk about Little Bighorn in retrospect. Uh, Custer made several important uh, tactical and strategic errors. He engaged the Lakota in summer when their horses had plentiful forage and could um, be ridden uh, much more quickly. The Lakota could be a lot more mobile in the summer because they had more to eat, both uh, the warriors and their horses. He underestimated the Lakota force. Uh, he didn't listen to his Crow scouts who reported that the Lakota and their allies were uh, too numerous to be engaged by Custer's force. And then to make matters worse, he divided his force and he gave very vague commands to his subordinates, Reno and Benteen, uh, who were not able to um, assist Custer in the battle in the way that uh, would have been better. And he also did not take advantage of the United States' logistical and industrial advantages. The United States could have had um, Henry rifles for their soldiers, but instead they chose to use the older, cheaper Sharps rifles. And Custer had access to artillery, like Gatling guns, but he chose not to bring them to the battle because they were going to slow him down too much. It would have been better if he'd attacked in the winter or in the spring, uh, if he'd used his Gatling guns, and if he'd used his infantry as well to overwhelm um, the Lakota opposing forces. The battle was one of the worst military defeats in U.S. history. Uh, but the U.S., uh, even though um, it was defeated, it could bounce back from this defeat. And it could bounce back from this defeat because of its industrial and logistical advantages. So in the end, the United States is able to defeat the Lakota and um, win the Sioux Wars. And they do this by sending additional reinforcements to the region in 1877. Uh, in 1877 is when Reconstruction ends. And it's when um, the issue of a possible second civil war with the South is diffused. So by early 1877, the um, United States is able to send more troops to the West to aid in uh, its victory against the Lakota. And this image shows um, modern day war reenactors, uh, U.S. cavalry reenactors, uh, and then um, Lakota reenactors at the Little Bighorn battle site. So in late 1876 and early 1877, as the weather got colder, the Lakota and their allies, um, they, run out, they run out of supplies. A lot of the Lakota and their allies will surrender to the United States in exchange for food. Um, they had a hard time finding enough food in the wintertime for a variety of reasons, which we'll discuss further. Um, they went to the Indian agencies and uh, surrendered in exchange for rations. What was left of the Sioux force, perhaps 500 troops, faced about 440 um, U.S. Army troops. Um, this would have included cavalry, infantry, and artillery on January 8, 1877 at Wolf Mountain in what is now the Montana Territory. This territory is a lot more mountainous, and there was heavy snow on the ground, which made Crazy Horse and the remaining uh, Lakota warriors not able to be as mobile, um, which was a strength of theirs. So their strengths are negated by the weather and by the terrain. Um, at the same time, these, these ne negatives don't affect the uh, U.S. soldiers as much because they're using a lot more infantry and artillery. And they also have food supplies and rations they brought with themselves. They can feed their horses on grain. They have given uh, rations to their soldiers uh, so that they are not worried about not having enough to eat. Uh, that's something that the Sioux are struggling with in the, uh, the final days of this war. The U.S. commander, uh, Colonel Nelson A. Miles, um, he was attacked by uh, the Lakota, but then he ordered a counterattack, and he drove the Sioux from their defensive positions on nearby hills. The casualties for this battle were fairly small, about three killed on each side, uh, but it was a strategic victory for the U.S. as it um, had driven the Lakota from the battle site, and it led to the end of the Great Sioux War. And this is a, a photograph of Nelson Miles from about the 1870s. You can see he's wearing a uh, fur hat. These were usually made of muskrat fur. And he's wearing what is probably a buffalo robe or buffalo cloak. These buffalo fur cloaks would have kept um, the soldiers very warm um, and would have allowed them to uh, be more active in uh, winter campaigning. 
This is a battle map of uh, Wolf Mountain. You can see that the uh, the X are uh, the Lakota Sioux. They engage um, Nelson's troops, but then they are defeated in the counterattack, as you can see from this battle map and from this illustration of, of the engagement. You can see the artillery and the infantry of the United States. So now we'll discuss um, or wrap up the Great Sioux War. Basically, the U.S. and its allies were able to defeat uh, the Sioux by going back to their roots of irregular warfare. They wore down the Sioux with their greater numbers, and they destroyed uh, their supplies in the fall of 1876, in the spring of 1877. And as winter set in, the uh, Sioux could not just find new supplies to make up for those that had been destroyed by the U.S. So running short on food and voyage, forage, the Lakota and their allies, they flee the region. Some go to Canada. Others will surrender to um, the United States, including Crazy Horse, who actually surrenders. Um, Crazy Horse is eventually going to be killed um, while trying to escape captivity. The U.S. government pressured the Sioux to sell or starve, um, to give up their lands in exchange for uh, rations from the U.S. Indian agencies. And the goal was to make um, Native Americans dependent on the U.S., that way they would have no choice but to surrender and that they wouldn't rise up again in the future. Uh, and this is a similar strategy actually taken with Confederates in uh, the Civil War during things like Sherman's March to the Sea and, and Phil Sheridan's uh, Shenandoah Valley campaign. It's just prosecuted much more aggressively against Native Americans. Uh, and this, this strategy of irregular warfare targeting Native American food supplies, while it was used um, during the, the Great Sioux War, and it was used even during the Civil War against um, the Confederates, it had been used for over a century before this, uh, going back to colonial times, as we've seen in this course, uh, during wars like uh, Sullivan's March and the American Revolution and um, the Pequot War, even in uh, the 1630s. Irregular warfare is not a new thing uh, by any means. And the U.S. would use uh, versions of this strategy for the rest of uh, its Indian wars, uh, exploit its industrial and logistical advantages, exploit divisions within Native American societies, and then target Native American food supplies and economic production to take away their means of making war. And here is an example of the United States in exploiting divisions within Native American society. These are Apache scouts who fought uh, on the U.S. side during the Apache Wars. Um, not all Apaches were fighting against the United States. Some, led by Geronimo here, fought against the U.S. as well as against Mexico. This image actually is of Geronimo and his, uh, his warriors. It's from 1886. It was taken actually shortly before they surrendered. It's believed to be the only um, picture of Native American soldiers in battle. Uh, all, all other photographs that we have of Native American soldiers from this period are, are of either Native American prisoners who have surrendered or they're of uh, Native Americans who are allied with the United States, like these uh, scouts, or they're just um, portraits taken of Native Americans. So this is actually a very historically significant uh, photograph of, of Native American warriors uh, in combat against the U.S., Part of uh, attacking economic production of Native Americans involved the killing of the buffalo. Uh, the buffalo were a key part of, essential part really, of uh, Native American uh, foodways and their food supplies um, in the Great Plains. And the U.S. quickly understood that and they continued uh, a policy of extermination of the buffalo that deprived Native Americans of food. And this was done to force belligerent Native Americans into surrendering. Also, it would have made allied Native Americans and even neutral Native Americans much more dependent on the U.S. government and much less likely of uh, rising up against the United States in the future. And the buffalo, as a result, was almost extinct by the end of the 1880s, um, from 13 million uh, buffalo down to about 1,000. And here we see um, buffalo hides being stacked and loaded onto trains to be sold in the east. We see buffalo skulls and horns, which could also be used for a variety of products. 
Um, sometimes the American, sol American soldiers and uh, civilian hunters would take the meat for themselves, but a lot of the time they just left the meat to decompose. This was part of a strategy of depriving uh, Native Americans of food. I should also add, though, that uh, in some parts of the American West, the buffalo herds were already on uh, the verge of extinction. But uh, throughout the entire West as a whole, that uh, near extinction was accomplished primarily by the, the U.S. Uh, government and uh, U.S. Um, hunters and soldiers. So now we'll discuss uh, the Wounded Knee Massacre or Wounded Knee Battle of 1890. Um, we'll discuss this uh, fairly briefly because in many ways it's much more of a, a massacre than a true battle. Um, Native American wars were de-escalating by about 1890 due to success of the U.S.'s long-term irregular warfare strategy, which we've discussed before. As more Native Americans surrendered to the U.S., and they move on to ever smaller reservations in exchange for uh, food supplies. On December 29th, 1890, a group of Lakota men gathered at Wounded Knee, South Dakota for the ghost dance ritual. And I will include a, uh, a link uh, for another video that goes into the details of what the ghost dance uh, was all about, uh, what the spiritual beliefs of the Lakota that were gathered for this ritual were. Uh, we, won't, we don't have time to discuss them here. The 7th U.S. Cavalry Regiment uh, tried to disarm the attendees, leading to a, a fight that turned into a massacre in which 90 of the 120 Lakota attendees were killed, compared to about 33 of the 497th U.S. Cavalry Regiment. The 7th Cavalry being the same unit that was uh, involved in, the, in uh, Custer's defeat at Little Bighorn. Obviously different soldiers, you know, this is um, over 10 years later. And this is considered by historians to be the end of organized native resistance uh, to the United States. Although there, are, there will be some isolated resistance into the 20th century, but this suppression of Native American resistance after Wounded Knee was handled primarily by uh, civilian law enforcement rather than the US Army. By the way, it's also uh, worth noting that um, many of the soldiers at um, uh, the Wounded Knee Massacre received Congressional Medal of Honor awards for their involvement in the, the massacre. And uh, a lot of them were uh, disgusted that they received that award for what they had done in the battle. So now I'll mention uh, the US Army's role in the conquest and assimilation of the West as a whole. Um, although the U.S. Army had focused primarily on defeating Native Americans in, contact, in combat and forcing them onto smaller reservations, the U.S. Army, including Generals uh, Sherman in the back of this image and Sheridan shown here, um, they had facilitated uh, the Interior Department, especially uh, Secretary Carl Schur's plan of forcible assimilation and acculturation of, a Na of Native Americans. The destruction of Native American lifeways, particularly the buffalo herds that um, kept their foodways going, forced Native Americans to live very differently, forced them to give up many elements of their culture. Um, the U.S. soldiers actually were often very suspicious of attempts to acculturate Native Americans, forced them to give up their culture and to adopt white Euro-American culture. Um, Sheridan, for example, suggested this coercion um, by whites was one of the many reasons that Native Americans would rebel against the United States. Uh, and, and by the way, the people like Carl Schurz, um, who wanted to acculturate and assimilate Native Americans, they believed that they were helping Native Americans. They believed that they were, in the words of, of the day, um, killing the Indian to save the man. That was the terminology that was used. Um, actually, Philip Sheridan was in some ways very sympathetic of Native Americans. Um, the old, the old um, quote that Sheridan is supposed to have said, the only good Indian is a dead Indian, he probably actually never even said that. And in his writings, he actually said, I understand why Native Americans fight against the United States. I, I understand it. So um, it's an area where, where we might want to revise our preconceived uh, notions of, of uh, the U.S. Army's attitude towards Native Americans. African Americans um, also 
played a role in the Native American wars out west. Um, they were called Buffalo Soldiers. That's actually a term used by Native Americans for black soldiers. Here are some images of, of the so-called Buffalo Soldiers. Here they're actually wearing Buffalo robes. This is probably taken during the winter time. Here they are wearing more standard US uh, Army uniforms. This is from later in the period. Also the first um, African-American graduate um, from West Point, Henry O. Flipper graduated during this period in 1877. So um, African-American soldiers also joined the US Army just as they had during the Civil War. And some of them saw action in the uh, American West. As I mentioned before, Native Americans often fought on the U.S. side uh, as uh, allies and as scouts. These are Apache scouts. Um, they're wearing a combination of uh, traditional Native American garb and uh, US, U.S. Army uniforms. So now we'll discuss um, the post-Indian War U.S. Army transition. After 1890, the U.S. Army's mission as Frontier Constabulary, an expansion force, had been fulfilled. For well over 100 years, the regular U.S. Army had spent most of its time on the frontier, uh, fighting uh, Native Americans, uh, protecting uh, the U.S. borders, or in some cases, expanding the U.S. borders at the expense of Native Americans, at the expense of Mexico, uh, etc. In addition, um, non-indigenous people are moving into the West. There were 2 million uh, non-indigenous people in the West in 1866. There's going to be 8.5 million by the 1890s. Um, demographers have said that the frontier is closed in 1890 as there um, are, are enough people for the region to no longer be considered frontier. There were now three or more people per square mile in the West. That was their reasoning. And it's because of this, um, the U.S. Army begins by closing down its smaller forts and installations, which were all across the West. They begin to consolidate their, their troops and their materiel in larger installations like uh, Fort Leavenworth in Kansas and Fort Sill in Oklahoma, just for example. This co um, consolidation allows for increased trends of professionalization in the U.S. Army. Um, they have more time to train and more time to practice and more time to become professional because they're not fighting Native Americans uh, anymore. The uh, army remains small and a large number of, it rank, of its ranks continue to consist of immigrants as well as um, um, poor uh, Americans. In some cases, African Americans also uh, remained in the army. Uh, Native Americans uh, did not really join the army in, in very large numbers after the 1890s. They were no longer really recruited in the same way. Uh, remember, native-born Americans were still very suspicious of standing armies, and if they were going to serve in the military at this point in history, they would have much rather served in the National Guard. The African-American soldiers in the U.S. Army, they faced a lot of discrimination. They served in segregated units. They were called Buffalo Soldiers, but that's not a pejorative term. It's not a negative term. And as I mentioned, there will be uh, Native Americans serving in the army after 1890, but in much smaller numbers. And because of um, the increase in professionalism, the consolidation of bases and the drawdown of troops, the, uh, the U.S. Army is able to overhaul its uniforms and arms and equipment during this period, which is uh, what we'll talk about uh, now. This is a reconstruction of a blockhouse or you know, sort of a fortified tower at Fort Abraham Lincoln, North Dakota. Um, this installation was abandoned um, by the U.S. Army after the Great Sioux War, um, and then it was demolished by local settlers who used the wood and the nails to build uh, civilian buildings. This is Fort Laramie, Wyoming. It was decommissioned a little bit later in uh, 1889 and 1890 as the um, wars against Native Americans are coming to an end. This is a image of, of Fort Laramie um, created while it was in use. And this is a um, modern uh, digital reconstruction of what the, the fort would have looked like with its wall and its towers and its barracks and stables on uh, the inside. After the 1890s, as I mentioned, the Native American um, peoples are 
uh, dealt with primarily by civilian law enforcement. Um, the small frontier posts are decommissioned and there's an increase in larger installations uh, like Fort Leavenworth here in Kansas, which had already been around for many years, but it becomes a lot bigger and its, its buildings become a lot more um, extensive. These larger bases um, have better facilities for personnel and, and garrison. There's more space in the barracks. The living conditions get a lot more comfortable. Uh, modern conveniences, including indoor plumbing, gas heaters, electricity are added to these buildings. Facilities like concert halls, gymnasiums, uh, better commissaries and hospitals and canteens are built for the use and care of soldiers and garrison. Uh, all of these facilities will increase morale and they also will prevent diseases as well. Better hospitals and better sanitation and indoor plumbing uh, mean that deaths by disease become a lot more, um, a lot more infrequent, a lot less common uh, from the 1890s on. Also, better facilities allow for uh, better military training and professionalization. Uh, in addition, soldiers' families uh, on these posts, they're going to receive better quarters as well now that um, the Native American threat has been neutralized. And this also will further increase morale of, of the soldiers because their family are living close by, their family are living better, so they're going to be happier. There's also um, some improvements to military med medicine and uh, health regulations. Uh, before the Civil War, being in garrison could actually be more hazardous to a soldier's health than being in combat uh, due to diseases like tuberculosis, cholera, um, dysentery. You know, th these were brought on by a lack of sanitation and really close uh, living quarters. The discussion um, and discovery of modern germ theory by scientists like Louis Pasteur and Joseph Lister. Uh, this is in the 1860s and 1870s. This will lead to the rise of modern antiseptics, um, which will significantly lower um, deaths from post-surgical infections. Um, soldiers are going to increasingly survive their operations, especially things like amputations, where the risk of, the, of infection in the Civil War and before was very high. And, it's a lot lower with the inter inter use of modern uh, antiseptics to prevent infection. Knowledge of germ theory also um, increased awareness of public health, and this would lead to better facilities for soldiers, um, indoor plumbing, larger, cleaner barracks, um, things like that. And they also um, inspire the construction of sanitary facilities for the use of troops. And they also um, lead to changes in military grooming regulations as well. Uh, for example, facial hair is going to be um, increasingly banned during this period. But soldiers out on the West, uh, out on their deployment on the frontier, they often, um, military regulations, especially about facial hair, often don't apply to them. Um, but these are trends you're going to see um, develop in the post-Civil War U.S. Army, and they're really going to increase after 1890 um, as a result of increased uh, military professionalization and consolidation of, of uh, U.S. military bases. Now we'll discuss the uh, U.S. Army uh, uniforms used during this period from 1866 or so to about 1890. And we do this because um, the uniforms used uh, by soldiers reflect the values and culture of American society and of the uh, U.S. military during this period. There is some variation in the uniforms, but there's also um, quite a bit of similarity as well. For example, um, navy blue is the standard color for uh, jackets, and uh, sky blue is the standard color for, for most uh, trousers. Sometimes officers will, well, will wear dark blue, but in general, they're still wearing blue uniforms. They're not wearing uh, like camouflage yet, uh, at least not standard issue. Early in the period, the uniforms are very similar to those during the, worn during the Civil War. There are some changes made in 1872 and 1875. These are some uniforms that were worn in the 1870s. As you can see, they look pretty similar to those worn by uh, soldiers during the Civil War, but there were additions like uh, decorative piping or uh, basically um, fabric added to the co collars to make the uniforms a little bit uh, more ornate. They're still very, very simple uniforms, very plain uniforms compared to those being worn by uh, Europeans 
there is some European influence uh, in, in US uniforms. Uh, before the Civil War, the United States really liked to copy French style uniforms, but because of France's very poor performance in the Franco-Prussian War, the United States is going to increasingly um, actually copy Germany or Prussia and also uh, Great Britain in its uniforms. For example, these, these sun helmets here, um, these are of a British style worn by uh, British soldiers deployed to tropical uh, regions. Some American soldiers wore sun helmets like this, but they generally didn't like them. They thought they looked weird. Um, they would have preferred just to wear traditional wide-brimmed hats uh, rather than these sort of strange British sun helmets. And um, campaign and fatigue uniforms, they had to be very versatile. Um, the climate of the American West is very volatile. It's, it's very, very hot in the summer and very, very cold in the winter, much more volatile than the Eastern United States or, or Europe. And so they're able to have nicer uniforms in garrison. That's where people are wearing things like, um, you know, German style um, uh, helmets, uh, French style kepis, which are beginning to be uh, phased out because as I said, Americans are, are losing interest in French style uniforms. Uh, for shoes, uh, soldiers actually have right and left shoes now, but they'll wear a variety of, of um, uh, boots and uh, shoes called brogains, uh, basically adapting to um, uh, the needs of their missions. For uh, winter time, they'll wear uh, muskrat fur caps and buffalo ro robes. And you'll also notice that soldiers on um, the western frontier Grooming regulations are not nearly as, as strictly enforced. Um, soldiers are not expected to like shave every day out, out west um, when they're fighting uh, against Native Americans. Here are some of the uh, uniforms worn by American soldiers during this period. These are more garrison style uniforms, dress uniforms. This is a, a German style helmet, which would have been worn uh, as part of a dress uniform, not really worn uh, for everyday use. It doesn't provide a lot of um, shielding from the sun or even protection for the wearer's head. Uh, it just looks uh, like something that the Victorian Prussians would have worn. You can also see uh, pillbox caps here. These were worn primarily in uh, garrison. They don't provide a lot of sun protection. They're kind of the uh, antecedent of uh, the garrison caps the triangular garrison caps that are gonna be worn in the 20th century. Also more uh, ornate uniforms with decorative piping are sometimes worn in, uh, in garrison, but simpler uniforms are worn out on the, uh, the, the frontier in combat. Here are soldiers actually deployed on the frontier um, sometimes summer uniforms were issued, and these were made of, of cotton or linen, and they were of a tan or gray color, uh, which is a lot cooler than dark blue. But in general, uh, U.S. soldiers wear dark blue uh, jackets and uh, light blue trousers. Also, wide-brimmed hats uh, called campaign hats, which are the antecedent of like what we think of as the modern-day uh, drill sergeant cover. Um, they're worn as well. You know, once again, they're trying to wear more practical covers. This soldier wears a uh, sun helmet as his cover, but as I mentioned before, American soldiers just didn't like the way the sun helmet, the British pith helmet looked. They thought it looked strange. So they preferred wide-brimmed hats as their cover. Um, here are American soldiers in uh, winter uniforms. Heavy overcoats are worn. Buffalo robes are worn, and probably the most practical winter cover is the uh, muskrat fur hat. It's uh, a lot like a modern-day uh, Russian-style Yushanka hat that you see people wear in the winter sometimes. And this would have, of course, protected um, the, the soldiers' ears from the cold winds of the American West. Here are some more examples of uh, uniforms during the period. You can see that the uh, uniforms used early on um, are very similar to those worn during the Civil War, but over time, uh, the uniforms evolve somewhat. They um, are adapted uh, wide-brimmed hats for sun protection, 
these wide brimmed hats were much better covers than um, the uh, French style kepis and forage caps, which um, really provide less sun protection than a modern day baseball cap. And of course, American soldiers in this period don't have sunscreen um, to keep from getting sunburned. So a uh, wide brimmed hat is a much better cover. Here are some more examples of some of the uniforms that were worn. There were often uh, substitutes made. Uh, American soldiers might wear civilian shirts underneath their jackets, or they might wear um, leather and buckskin uh, coats over their uniforms. Some variations and um, deviation from regulations was permitted uh, for soldiers out on the campaign uh, away from the garrison as is common with militaries even today in the 21st century, um, allowing soldiers to wear uh, some civilian clothing would have given them the opportunity to signal their elite status, uh, that they were on campaign fighting enemies of the country rather than being sequestered in a barracks. In some ways, a lot like how uh, modern day uh, US special forces and, and Navy SEALs wear a combination of civilian clothing and um, regulation U.S. military uniforms. Also, the officer here wearing the, um, the buckskin jacket, he's wearing a uh, French style chapeau, uh, bi-cornered, um, or two-sided, kind of almost like what we think of as Napoleon hat. These hats become a lot less common because they're not very practical. Um, they're uncomfortable to wear and they don't provide much sun protection. Uh, these gradually get phased out after the war. Interestingly enough, though, they're actually, this is a collapsible chapeau. It can be balled up and put into a bag when it's not being worn as cover. Here are some uh, more images of U.S. soldiers and some of the other military personnel they would have come in contact with. This is a uh, Buffalo soldier in a Buffalo robe. Um, it's a much warmer uh, garment than the uh, standard U.S. military overcoat. As I mentioned, a lot of soldiers substituted civilian uh, clothing when they had access to it. Uh, the Buffalo soldiers also wearing a bandana, uh, presumably of civilian manufacture, to signal that he is out on the frontier, that he's out fighting, as opposed to just being stuck in garrison. Here is a uh, Can Canadian mounted policeman, or Mounties as they're called today, U.S. soldiers on the northern border, they might have had contact with uh, the mounted policemen of Canada. Here are some Apache scouts wearing a combination of, of U.S. military jackets and then uh, indigenous uh, clothing and you know, boots and moccasins on their, uh, their um, um, as trousers. Interestingly enough, this American soldier here is actually wearing uh, indigenous style uh, legging uh, moccasins, uh, copying his, his uh, Apache comrades. So there's cultural syncretism in uh, US uniforms, especially on the frontier. And that's a trend that we've seen throughout American military history. So to wrap things up, the US military played an important role in the reconstruction, uh, Gilded Age industrialization and defeat of Native Americans and the integration of the American West. Even though Reconstruction was a failure um, due to a lack of support from white civilians, um, the U.S. Army was victorious over Native Americans in the West, and it was successful in suppressing uh, labor strikes in uh, the American heartland. The U.S. regular professional army's mission changed during this period. Uh, as Reconstruction uh, comes to an end, um, Native American resistance is basically stopped and labor strikes are suppressed. Um, the militias, uh, which become the National Guard, will take over the labor strikes suppression from the U.S. Army. The U.S. Army is withdrawn from uh, the South, from Reconstruction. And of course, the U.S. Army does eventually defeat Native Americans uh, by the, about the 1890s. And with the end of these conflicts, uh, the U.S. Army is able to emphasize its professionalization and its modernization, even as its uh, ranks shrink. There's about 57,000 uh, U.S. soldiers in 1866. There's only going to be about 27,000 um, regulars in 1890. 
The militias also are going to be standardized, modernized, and professionalized during this period, uh, evolving into the uh, U.S. National Guard that we know today, with there being about 100,000 National Guard by the 1890s. And the professionalization of the U.S. military that takes place as a result of its changing missions in the post-Civil War period will greatly facilitate the expansion of the American empire outside of the continental U.S., which will be the subject of our uh, next video.